we're there. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Jumping Instructors Live. My name is Randy Thompson, and we are going, we have a great, great things that are going to be happening today. So we're excited to see you here. And then we'll be showing you more about what will be coming up in the future. And for now, I'd like to introduce you to my producer and co-host, Laura Kelland May. Hi there, everybody. How's it going? Laura is a Canadian senior hunter, jumper, equitation, hack, judge, and steward. She's also like Patty and I, we've oh, probably you too, Robert. We've spent, we all, we're all speakers. We've spoken at like the three ladies here. We spoke at the World Equestrian Games in 2018. But I'm going to give it to you we now, Pat. Uh, pardon me? Said we were good, also. We were, we were, we were, <laughs> we were we legends fun. in our own minds. <laughs> That's right. We exactly. were legends in our own minds. All right, Laura, take okay. it away. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome Randy and Robert and Patty for coming today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to get this show on the road. Special thanks to, to Randy. Randy has been certifying and coaching riding instructors, horse and rider training, marketing and business for over 25 years. She's a horse industry legal consultant and expert witness. She's the founder of several Facebook pages, including Jumping Instructors, Dressage Instructors, Movers and Shakers of the Horse World, and How to Market Your Horse Business. Thank you so much, Randy. Really appreciate you putting these live shows together because I really think we needed to do something during this time when we're kind of sequestered in our homes. I agree. Yeah. Also like to welcome Patty. Patty Downing Nygaard. Hi, Patty. How are things in the mountain today? The mountains are beautiful today. I actually am in town. So I'm oh. on my second at a friend's house. Yeah. I know. Six feet, six feet. We got it. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, uh, it's amazing. It is so pretty out after three or four days of overcast and dreary, drizzly weather. So we're excited. Excellent. Yeah. Up uh, there in Canada. Oh, it's good. Patty is a USEF large R hunter, jumper, and equitation licensed judge for over 25 years, but she says 35. She keeps correcting me when I say that, and has judged at some of the most prestigious shows in North America, including Devon, Wellington, Harrisburg, Hits, Marshall and Sterling Finals, and the West Coast Pony Finals. You can get a hold of Patty on her Facebook page, and I'll put the link to the Facebook page in the comments section. And we have a special guest today, Robert Robold. Hi, Robert. How are you doing? Doing very well. And uh, thank you for inviting me to such a prestigious panel. Ah, Good to see all your you. smiling faces. <laughs> thank you, Robert. Where are you uh, coming in from today? I'm coming in from the east coast of Florida in the shadow of the missiles. Uh, right now, my home is in a little town called Port St. John, but I grew up on Merritt Island and um, um, I'm enjoying a beautiful day here. Excellent. So Robert is a USEF large R hunter, hunter breeding, equitation, and jumper judge. He is an 11-time national champion and winner of 10 Silver Stirrup Awards. Thank you so much, Robert, for uh, coming and sharing your expertise with us today. Well, thank you. Excellent. So, Patty, do you want to take it away from here and we'll get going with some questions yeah. and comments? I do. So, again, good afternoon. And Robert today is going to talk about a few things, but the first thing is something he's quite a genius at is. Um, showing horses, young horses and ponies in hand. And uh, he does it really well and there is quite an art to it. And we thought that that would be a good thing for him to talk about today. Um, you may not have young horses, but most of you have ponies and they model and mm -hmm. how you can make, uh, what did I say the other night? It's like uh, making them stand like you, you like yourself to look in a selfie. Mm -hmm. So you fix things to make them look better. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a very good analogy. And um, it's, it's great that you brought it up to, to um, something that's so modern because, uh, you know, that wouldn't have a selfie. I'm not much of a selfie person myself, so that would have never come to mind. But um, you're right. It is, it is um, a type of a, a fashion show. Um, some of it's a little bit of an illusion because none of them are absolutely perfect. 
So, you know, it's, it's good to spend enough time with your horse and know your raw materials and um, spend a little bit of time teaching them to stand and figure out ways to make them appear more correct. If they have a flaw or something, there's ways to stand them and um, help that look less severe, if not invisible. I like so, how, when I saw the picture that you shared, how you even got that pony stretching. Was it a him or a her stretching? It's a stallion, stretch. actually. Oh, it's stallion. It's, uh, stretch is so beautiful. Well, how are you? Te how would you tell somebody how to teach their horse how to be able to get that stretch that he had in the photo? Can we get a copy of that photo and share it on here, Laura? Well, I yeah, have, sure. I have oh. several of them. This is this is yeah. one of my guys. I don't oh, know nice. if you can see it. This one yeah. is. Um, Tango, uh, Mary Joan Henson's horse. Um, we were national champion as a yearling, uh, two-year-old, and reserve as a three-year-old, and I won several um, Silver Stirrups Award, which is a, um, a breed honor. Um, basically, this one was a um, Oldenburg, so I got the Silver Stirrup from the Oldenburg Association. Um, this is another one. Um, and once again, I don't know their show names, and I really was it I'm not much of a point chaser this or that those honors were were earned from a lot of hard work and and caring about the horses and wanting them to have you know young horse experiences and um excuse me <clears throat> with the hunter breeding they have to be trailered they get braided they get bathed they get you know hoof oil put on them um, they're taught to keep a a respective pace or a respective space between you know, this is your space. This is my space. Some of them, you know, like to show you their belly button. Some of them can be a little nippy. Um, some of them can be a little strikey. Um, and, um, you know, knowing once again what you have mentally as well and maybe giving them a little lunge or taking them for a walk, anything like that to, to present them in the ring at peak performance like you would want to do with any type of performance animal or, or sport for that matter. The idea is to peak in the ring. Um, and, you know, at this time when, when we cannot really go to the farm or, or we cannot really take them and expose them to different life experiences, you know, some really good things to work on and that I've found with some of my clients is right now is a good time to teach them to wear a bridle. You know, some of these young horses, you take them to the show and decide that they're going to put a bridle on for the first time. Well, that's a little bit much. Right. But, you know, you're going to do that, especially with a yearling, and then walk them down to the ring. Um, um, and they have to be shown in a plain snaffle. Um, and sometimes, you know, I like to find one with a little bit of rubber on it or something because metal can be a little harsh for something that young or they're teething. They've got, you know, all the baby issues going on. Um, some, you know, the, the, the foals, the broodmares and a lot of the Arabs that are two and under there, they are allowed to show in a halter. So if you do have those type of animals, then, um, you, um, you know, you, it's not as concerning, but still at some point you might want to ride them. Doesn't hurt to practice putting a bridle on them. Um, braiding, you know, some of the young horses get very stressed with braiding. If you simply just go in and spend some time putting rubber bands in their mane, fiddling with their mane, getting them used to having somebody, you know, do that. Um, their tail as well. Um, you know, like I said earlier, none of them are perfect. So practice standing them up. You know, uh, they improve really quickly following your body. And it doesn't take a much. I like them to walk up and, and go forward into a stance as opposed to try to back them into one. They seem to stand over themselves more balanced that way. And um, just spending a little bit of time with them walking, you know, you can teach them to follow your body. So when I walk, they walk. When I stop, they stop. And you don't really have to use the bridle that much. And then you make your minor adjustments. I've always found that indirect rein aids work the best because horses tend to are supposed to back in diagonal pairs. That's the correct way to back, not one foot at a time. So you are shifting diagonal pairs when you're practicing your horse's stance. And when I want to move the left front right hind diagonal, I use the opposite rein. I'll use the left rein and then vice versa. Um, it doesn't work on every single horse. You know, a little bit of experimenting is is the key to that. So when um, you when you are backing, backing your horse, you're saying, you're saying 
a yeah. little bit on both surfaces. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If I want the left front, right hind diagonal to move, I use I use the right rein, the opposite rein, and that moves that diagonal. But like I said, ideally, you want to teach them to walk forward into their setup. Um, they tend to be better balanced. Um, the, seems like the more you fiddle with them, the the, the worse it can get. <laughs> so there, there's a question here. You have an uh, ad from, going on there, by the way. Oh, you asked 30. the question there? No, you have an echo. Oh, we all have. Hi, Doc. So I'm, what I'm seeing is what age does it, it do you start putting a bit in a baby's mouth? Well, they have to show in with a bit as a yearling. So, uh, you know, when they're a year old, that's that's the that's when you would start introducing that if you're going to show them in hand. Excellent. Excellent. So yeah, how are you teaching them to move their feet when you have them stand up in their position? Are you using, well, how do you teach them to start responding that way? Um, usually just, just, a, just spending a little bit of time with them. They, they do, you know, move away from pressure. They're supposed to, whether you're riding them, whether you're on the ground with them, they're supposed to respond by moving away from pressure. A lot of times I'll carry a short bat and at first I'll put pressure on the reins or even before I put the bridle on, if they, if, you know, I think that this is going to be too much, too fast, because we don't want them to be reactive. We want them to be relaxed and enjoy this, this work. Um, a lot of times I'll use a halter and I'll tap them on the chest with a, a little bat and, and, you know, and, and kind of say, come on, back, back, back. And, and I walk into them. So once again, they're following my body. And, um, like I said, that it's something they really improve on quickly. It's really amazing how quickly that they improve and, and get it. it. It baffles me how quick they get it. <laughs> it, wouldn't be you. it wouldn't be just you, right, Robert, with all your experience? <laughs> no, I've, I've helped other people with their young animals and, um, and, uh, and it, it, they, it, it's not, yeah, they really do respond. <laughs> Okay, so we have that picture here. I'm going to share it. You asked me to get a picture, right, Randy? Oh, right, right. This is so where I'll, you have the, the stallion. Try to share it. Last time I tried this, um, my computer just kind of went not too good. There's the picture. Can you tell us about this little stallion, uh, Robert? That's um, Catalan Valley's Manhattan. He's an imported stallion that stands in Ocala. Um, Gene Munger owns him and um, has asked me to stand him and several of his get in the Welch classes. He's obviously not eligible for hunter breeding. He's he's a Levitt, I believe, this year. But um, I've um, him and several of his get I've stood. There's a um, two-year-old that I'm standing right now that's by him that's a large. He's a Section B. He, he's a little bigger than what we would call a medium. But this large one, Broadway, is just absolutely amazing. And I'm hoping that he gets to finish out the year and, and show enough. I believe he's he's got Oldenburg papers that go with him. And so we might end up getting another Silver Stirrup Award. <laughs> Excellent. So here, here's a question that I've had people ask me when I've done the stand-up part of a clinic. When you get them to stretch their neck out like that, how do you keep them from leaning their shoulder over forward so that their feet get underneath too far behind them it takes a little bit of practice and each and i found that each of them have a different personality sometimes res horses will respond to a little thing of tic tacs um some people like to use some um wrapper off maybe a uh, peppermint um some people take their hat off i usually wear mm -hmm. a cap and just kind of hold the cap in front of them and they want to you know they're interested in what's inside it, maybe. Um, some people will bend down and pick up a little bit of grass. Um, there's different mm -hmm. ways, usually to keep them from rocking forward. When I stand them up, I'll tap them on the chest, and that's kind of from practice their way of knowing that, you know, we're done here with the forward stuff or the backward stuff. That little tap on the chest is, is just part of the conditioning. And um, then, you know, from there, I find out what interests them. And like I said, um, with the more recent cult of Jessica Versaghi's, um, that one 
responded really well to a, some Tic Tacs in a, in a, in a plastic container. Um, Manhattan, he, he likes it when you stand in front of him and, and snap your fingers. That kind of the black horse that you showed the picture of, that's usually how I can get him to, to really show out and show off is to kind of snap my fingers and he goes, Oh, what you got? And, um, um, his, his get Broadway, um, he responds to a, a, a plastic wrapper of some sort. And um, so, yeah, each of them, you know, there's not, and it's not, none of it's etched in stone. You just got to know your horse, figure out what works. Well, and I think in this, if trainers are still going to their barns and they're still doing, this is a great time to work with those when the kids aren't around and to give them some sort of a system so that's something they can work on with the riders when they do come back or if they're doing private lessons or because so many of them don't know. And when I judge a model class, I don't know, Robert, I don't know if you guys do this too, or Laura, um, I, I want to just stop and give them a little clinic and say, <laughs> stand your horse <laughs> up. You have a beautiful, have a beautiful uh, uh, pony and let's put all four feet on the ground. And um, wait, at the very least, get your horse's ears up even. Something. Yeah. Something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, once the judge walks up to you, you know, unless you can make a quick fix, you're really done. Um, you know, you don't want to be running around the pony or the horse and, and making these adjustments and this and that. You might end up showing your horse in a worse light. Like if his hindquarter is a little slight and you're backing him up, he's going to tuck that rump under. The judge is going to go, well, you know, that's a pretty weak hindquarter. It doesn't look equally proportioned to the chest and the midsection, which you like to see. So, you know, sometimes it can it can hurt you if the horse is, you know, if you're fiddling with them when the judge walks up to you. Well, that's true. But they need to be, that, however, being prepared before the judge comes up is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it, part of it is, and, and I don't say this very often, is lack of training on the trainer's part. They don't teach the kids to do that. So you guys that are listening. Well, work. even even Patty, when they do the jog for the hunter classes, some of the, I mean, this is kind of the, the in hand part of the jog is some of those horses, slash ponies that aren't, aren't jogging properly. They, they literally, they don't know how to do it. They don't and know how to do it. That's it. true. And so, it, again, it's something to remember, and it's a detail that makes puts, a difference. it makes a difference. And I can't tell you how many in the last five years I've had to re-jog classes because the first one will jog in. I'm the judge. I'm halfway up the ring, and they'll jog in, and then they'll walk right in front of me. <laughs> then everybody else is like a pile up on the interstate. Mm -hmm. So then I'll make them go all, all the way back and have the engage guy tell them how to. So it, that could be on that pet peeve um, that we we're going to do. So anyway, we kind of got off the, the yeah. subject. Actually, it. not. It's 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 still part of the in hand work. You know, they they the horses need to follow you. When you jog, they should jog too, and for as long as you're going to jog. And um, so, you know, any of that with the, the pony kids, with, with um, the young horses, any of that is invaluable time spent with them. Yes. Um, it, it, you know, so many people will breed a lot of, a lot of animals and, and then all of a sudden as three-year-olds, well, it's time to start working with them and, and, and breaking them. And you end up, you end up, you know, with some, some animals traumatized because they're just not ready for it and have nothing to base it on except maybe getting caught to get to see the vet for their shots or maybe caught to see the farrier once again you know if that's all that they get handled which does happen in some cases then it it can be quite traumatizing and quite quite confusing to an animal that i mean let's face it um has to be conditioned to a response it's not that you're not just going to teach them right right exactly Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a good, I, I think that's all, all good information. And hopefully um, some of the listeners will pay attention to it and look at some of your pictures. And um, I'm, Laura, I'm assuming that you've put um, all of Robert's information on the 
on the board. Oh, yes. So you can check on it. I'm sure you have. And uh, so I think that um, I think that looking at those photographs and in copying, sometimes it's good to copy. Mm -hmm. So it's good to copy how those horses and ponies are standing. Exactly. And, you know, and in our world, I, um, we don't reach down and set their feet like they'll do in the quarter horses. Sometimes they'll actually reach down and pick a foot up and set it somewhere. And I don't think we do that very often. No. And, um, yeah. And uh, so but you can do all sorts of fun things like with the tails and you can fan that tail out and cover up a bump on a hawk or. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things. Is, it, is the judge permitted to uh, touch the horse at all? No. No. But no, you know, that's if, a no, if, no. If, if the tail is covering a bump on the hawk, as like what Patty said, the judge will just kind of have to look around the thing. Or you got to look around it and see if you can catch it in the jug. I don't mean to talk over you, but that's that's mm -hmm. usually what happens. You look around it or you try to catch it when they jog. Because they all have the job. Can, yeah, most of the time you can tell. And I used to do it too. I mean, it is show. You're trying to show off your horse. Um, but most of the time you can go, you know, that tail, that that's purposely kind of fanned out. Mm -hmm. And um, so then you do watch it when they jog. And then usually if they come back, if you go right to them and look, you can, you can see it. Mm -hmm. But it's, you have to be aware of it which means you probably had to do it at some point in time. <laughs> right. I've also yeah. even seen in the confirmation classes for the green hunters the or the, yeah, the green hunters. Um, I've seen some with bar shoes and they stand them up and kick some dirt around it. So you can't really see it. And uh, you, well, you, you know, you got to catch it in the jog. Yeah. Now they've told us to forgive that a little bit. Yeah. Because it was showing so much. And so it's like we create our, own little horse show world, I guess, but um, <laughs> yeah. So we were just talking about young horses and putting bridles on and mm -hmm. on on the yearlings and and getting them prepared if you're going to show them in hand. And even if you're not, it's a good time to start. Um, it, it's kind of covering the next one, which is to kind of need to know what and how to use and do your young horse and what the steps are you take to start one. Um, maybe mm -hmm. they haven't been showing in hand. And um, that would be a, a good one. And then yeah. in the middle of all that, we'll, we'll all talk about it. But the, the, it would be kind of when you, when you know to move from the pole to the cross rail to the okay. vertical. Uh, Patty, the before we get to that, do oh, we got another question here, if that's okay. Uh, the positive equine, thank you so much for the comment here. Will, you, will doing liberty with your horse help them learn to follow your actions, such as trotting when you speed up or halting when you halt? Um, I don't do personally a lot of liberty work. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, like to, I like to have more, more um, I like to have closer contact and, and clearer directions, you know, with the liberty, it 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 does take a little bit more time and a little bit more patience and and whatnot to get them to understand. A lot of them uh, at liberty do learn that you know when you point, they 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 turn around and go the other way, or when you hold your hands up, they're supposed to walk to you. And um, you're welcome, Jean. You're supposed to they're supposed to walk to you and maybe get a treat. Um, I don't usually do liberty work myself. I've seen where it's been very beneficial to some people. And once again, enjoy your horse. It's supposed to be fun and make sure that the liberty work is fun for the horse too. Yeah, that's a good one. I've never done much of it, but I have watched it done beautifully. Mm -hmm. And I thought, whoa, I wish I had the patience to do that. So Yeah, there's some that's done really nicely. And then there's some that maybe aren't so nice. So, Patty, so you were anyway, going on about yeah. uh, what? Uh, how do you know when you want to move up? Is that what your question? Well, well we were talking to <laughs> the start with young horses, and I thought it kind of all f fell into actually one thing would be kind of. Um, well, well, with the young riding horses, you know, I kind of, I kind of call it, I kind of coin my own phrase, the non-reactive zone. Um, you know, as you're putting a saddle on them in the, the, the bare bones beginning, um, you know, teaching them to go around in a, on a lunge line, um, I like a little bit of driving. 
all of those basic first beginner beginner steps you know it, it's an individual thing but i try to get them in the non-reactive zone so in other words in, when you're putting a saddle pad on them do they lift their head up and get big eyes okay that's that's stress you know that's a sign that you know they're concerned so you know you do it until you put the saddle pad on them and they just still hang their head and kind of look at you like um you got another carrot <laughs> um you know same with the saddle with the girth some horses are more sensitive than others and it's it's nice to 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 pay attention to the signs of stress or something some kind of reactive response and and do it enough to where you don't have the negative reaction which is usually not fun <laughs> um same with getting on them for the first time you know you're developing their personality for the rest of their life at this stage if you scare them you know, a lot of times traumatic experiences never ever go away. So it's best to 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 not to avoid anything traumatic and not get in a hurry. Take your time. Get into that non-reactive zone to where they're relaxed and comfortable with the work and do something that makes them enjoy it. Um, moving on to when you start riding them, you know, your first order of business is to get them to go straight and forward. Um, and, um, you know, even with some horses, it doesn't matter which way they're going. As long as they're going straight and forward, you know, take that as a win. Eventually, they have to learn to move away from pressure. A very good horseman taught me one time that your horse isn't truly broke until they move away from both reins and both legs. So I've taken that um, thought and that, and that to all of my young horses. So... You know, I do transitions like from the walk to the halt, something that, that's slow and that basic, and see how the horse reacts. They should give when you take. Uh, some horses will stiffen their jaw and lift their head up. A lot of t times that if they've been on the racetrack or have previous experiences or whatnot, then, you know, it takes you a couple of times to get them to realize that when you take, you want them to give. And But once again, they will do it if you're persistent and, and, you're, and you're kind about it. Um, once they do that, I get them to turn their head and give to each rein. Once again, I want them to give. And then, and then eventually I want them to move away from each leg. And um, rather it be a leg yield, rather it be a shoulder in. And um, I'll once again, start slow. Start with the walk. The more speed you have, the more things can get out of control. Um, but yeah, the first step, get them going straight and forward. Then I like to get them to move away from pressure. And, and um, I found that after they go straight and forward and you do teach them to move away from your leg, that aha moment when they realize they can cross their legs uh, opens up so many doors. It's amazing what happens after that. Yes, and I, that's, I, I love long lining the young horses and it's mm -hmm. something real I'm good at. And I, so it, it makes it, it's kind of an art you can teach them all that stuff with the saddle on and and it's so it's so easy when you get on them mm -hmm. it absolutely because once again you're in that non-reactive zone they're not they're, they're not reacting i i know some people that should be in the non-reactive zones <laughs> get in line <laughs> hi cory taylor so next um so the next thing is is so you get them through all of that and you've got them i have a question about that if that's sorry. all right uh robert how long does that take like it you've given a kind of a, a whole program there right make sure they're non-reactive they're comfortable there's they you know does that take a year does it take an hour well i've had some young horses that i've i've started um, from the saddle to getting on them and teaching them to move away pre from pressure competently in 30 days. Now it's not perfect. Um, and you still have the young horse, you know, oopsies now and again. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course there's variables like, oh, I'm going to spook at that today cause it's windy and where the day before or the day after it's not, you got these variables, but you know, a horse that it's a clean slate and you've, and you've done your due diligence and you haven't scared them, you can get quite far in 30 days. Um, and then from there, you just keep building on the repertoire. You're getting them conditioned. You know, they're growing too. 
They have to adjust to weight on their back. They have to adjust to the muscles, to the growth. Um, a three-year-old's growing till they're six. Don't think that, you know, they're, they're going to be able to handle all the, everything right away. You got to give them time to develop and grow. And you can actually watch them. And it's, and it's fun to watch, actually, when they start to get a little bit of a crest on their neck when they turn four and a half or so and their hind quarter finishes growing and it, it's starting to really bloom out. And, and of course, if you, they love it when I love it when they do that and they get dapples in the spring. It's kind of fun, right. to, kind of fun to see. Excellent. So we have so, a, another comment I'm sorry. here. From, that's okay. Jacqueline is watching in New York, Mrs. Your Pony in Decca, Florida. Does that mean something? Oh, Jacqueline, yes. Uh, um, when she comes for the summer to visit her grandmother, I, um, her grandmother has a pony for her, and her um, summer time is a lot of times um, camp at Foxley. Um, she's in the IEA program in New York, and obviously, and she can't ride right now. Um, they're, they're not allowing anybody to come to the stables where she's at. But, um, yeah, she's, she's a great kid. That's I enjoy fun. working with her. I have a question for you on that. A lot of professionals have clients that try to get them to push their horses faster than the trainer wants them to do. So what would you recommend to the trainers out there, the professionals, how they can handle the customers who want them to push their horses faster than they're ready for? Great question, wow. Randy. Um, I, I usually kind of lead by example. I try not to be too dictatorial and I try to sort of say, you know, well, a lot of people get in a hurry if their horses are for sale. They got to get them, you know, in the ring. They got to get them winning. They, you know, you put a good rider on one, you're going to get away with more than you would, you're, you know, as a layman or what have you. Um, but I don't really... I don't really get dictatorial personally myself. I try to lead by example and and tell them, okay, you know, this is this is how I I would handle it, and this is why. And it typically, once again, if they're young, you're developing their personality for the rest of their life. If you skip steps, if you scare them, if you you know, you could get hurt. They could get hurt. Is 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 a reality of all that too. Mm -hmm. So um, usually. I just try to encourage just a little bit of patience and then hope when I get in the car and leave that they, they, uh, they, they, um, are, they listen. are, are listening. Well, you have to hope that they have enough respect for you and they're paying for your opinion. And so yeah. to do that, I also think that like with a rider that wants to do more that I'll come up with an exercise poles on the ground or something that's a little tough to do. And mm -hmm. so, um, and they think they're smart, and they think they've got it. And then, so you take a young horse and you give it a little, a little extra stuff to do, and they can't get it done. Mm -hmm. They're running. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so you go, okay. So when you get this done well, then the next step can be we can add this to it and this to it. Give them a little bit of a program and some goals to uh, attain. I think works. Well. Yeah, you're dangling the carrot. You're giving some something to work towards. That's another. That's a very good. That's a very good way to look at it. And and I I think I probably you probably do it. You just don't even realize you do. Right. It. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got your young horse and it's going along and it's walking and trotting and I'm assuming cantering before you do you canter them before you jump them. I try to, because once again, you know, it's all about teaching them to um, carry weight, balance, you're developing them until you get them to where they can pretty much walk, trot and canter with some proficiency and some sort of a rhythm. I don't like to jump them. Um, usually when you're trotting a jump, you I like them to land cantering. So mm -hmm. yes, of course, I'd like them to be cantering before I jump them. Um, cause that simply just teaches them to jump across the jump. If you teach them to land in a trot, sometimes, you know, they end up using it as a cavaletti and they don't actually jump. Right. That's um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what I personally like to do. So what exercises do you do? So you've got one that walks, trots and canters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to start it to go across jumps. Mm -hmm. What? 
you have any specific exercises you could share? I know you have exercises for a quick course, which we'll get to in a little bit. But, right. Um, do you have specific exercises or is this thing that you do to start them with? It's, it's, um, I kind of evaluate the horse and gauge that to them. Um, some horses, I'll just start with a single pole on the ground, teach them to walk back and forth, trot back and forth, canter back and forth. Um, some horses that, that, that I need them to stop and think a little bit, maybe I'll put four poles down about two feet apart so they have to walk through them. And that gives them an opportunity to stop and think and realize that this is not a race. We don't need to be in a hurry, you know, and I can negotiate this. And, um, you know, I, I'll do that. Trot poles um, about a meter apart, three foot, three foot, three inches apart. Um, very good at teaching them to, to go over something confidently and, and let them know they can go over something without being in a hurry. And, um the suspension of, of doing the trot poles also helps with your horse's conditioning, um, helps with their development because they have to they have to stay in the air a little longer going over something like that. Um, and we, you know, a lot of people use hill training if you have the luxury of that. We, we in Florida, in most places, don't have any hills. So Cavaletti is a good alternative to that as well, trot poles. Um, then once they're, they're non-reactive, I keep using that word, but that's what I call it. Once they're relaxed and comfortable and breathing normally doing that, then I, I'll add an X behind it. Um, so I'll have, you know, three trot poles and an X or maybe one trot pole and an X. Once again, it depends on the horse. If um, they're a little bit timid, a little bit nervous, three trot poles to an X is probably too much. So um, maybe, you know, you would just have an eight or nine foot placing pole to an X when, when you get to that point. Okay. Um, so and yeah, because we're gonna, we're, you're so interesting. We're gonna run out of time, um, but I really want to show the exercises. We we asked you to do the exercises for quick courses because we have a lot of questions from the people watching. Is you know how do I keep my horse from getting so quick to the jumps? Um, and uh, you did some really cool exercises for that. And if you could share those with us, and um, Oh look, Lord. Well, this is this is one this is one that I use for the hunters, and I see that in my and I I I sent the picture of the wrong one because I don't have the footage in between, but um, I this is the end all. Um, once again, I the horses that tend to be quick have to get have an opportunity to to feel like they can go over something without getting in trouble. So a lot of times I will set this exercise up with just poles on the ground and let the horses walk through them. Then let the horses trot through them. And if they start trying to jump the whole thing, if they start to get quick, if there's really reactive, then I back it off. And then I'll put down walk poles, trot poles, anything to get them to a point to where they feel confident and comfortable going over something and not, you know, thinking that they have to get to the other side really fast. Um, so then from there, you have a placing pole at the end, you have a placing pole, you have an X, and then you have another placing pole about, I don't know, it'd probably be eight, nine feet out, um, 16 feet to a vertical, another placing pole in the middle, 18 feet to an oxer, and then about 12 feet to a pole at the end. And, um, depending on the horse, um, you know, I'll take all the poles away. Once they're not reactive over just going over something, I'll do the pole to the X with a placing pole behind it. Then I'll add the vertical with the placing pole behind it. Then the oxer with the placing pole behind it. Now, this is set for the horse, 8 to 9 feet, 16 to 17 feet, 18 to 19 feet, and then 12 foot on the back. This actually gets the horse to wrap around the jumps and, and take their time looking where they have to put their feet. Um, I, I did have an occasion last year in Holland to teach a clinic. They're trying to do hunters and equitations. And a lot of the horses, you know, have, have been in the jumper ring only. And that's what they do there. So for this new discipline that they're trying to horse show and, and, and whatnot, this exercise was extremely beneficial to them because by the end, even the young horses were jumping off the ground slowly, taking their time over the jump, and giving a nice round jump with their bascule in the middle. 
and that's what the placing poles do. It kind of gives them a parameters to and makes and helps them wrap around the jumps. I've loved that. And then um, for the jumpers, um, I please. simply the second. I'm sorry. There we go. Oh, for the jumpers, the second jump is an oxer. Um, the oxer encourages them to, um, you know, be a little quicker with their front end, you know, that gives them a little more substance to come around. And then the vertical after the oxer will come up a teeny bit short, which makes them back off and have to pay attention to what they're doing or they're going to bump a rail. And a lot of them don't like to do that. Um, and once again, I start, I, I start and get them to a point to where they're non-reactive in this actual exercise. And once again, eight or nine feet to the X, 16, 17 feet to the oxer, 18 to 19 feet to the last vertical, and then a 12 foot placing pole. Um, working up to that as the end result has been good for the jumpers that I've been able to, to bring along and work with. And um, that's a great exercise too, for the riders, the equitation and, if you have an older horse, it maybe isn't quick, but it's a great one because it's, they say balanced. And mm -hmm. I, I do ones very similar to that um, with the big Eck riders without stirrups and get them to hold their balance because things happen continuously and in a rhythm. So, mm -hmm. it's, and if it's, and if it's set for the individual horse, which a gymnastic of any kind is supposed to be, then they can sit still and let the horse do the work underneath them. And so they can get a feel for not, you know, jumping ahead, helping the horse, doing any of those visible things that are simply overriding. Um, right. Good point, Patty. Did you, hey. did you give the distances between poles and jumps? I see the eight pole, to nine feet. I just put it in the middle. Um, okay. I just eyeball about the middle. Um, the first placing pole, eight to nine feet, depending on the horse's trot. And even with the jumper one, you can do an 18 foot pole and spread it out to 22 and 24 feet and canter it like that. Um, I've also done that. And you don't necessarily have to trot in for the jumper one. For the hunter one, I prefer to trot into. But this would turn in, the first pole would turn into an 18 foot pole. So you do pole, stride, vertical, ox, or vertical, and you have to adjust it for cantering in not trotting in which once again would be 18 feet to the to a vertical instead of an x probably 23 feet to an oxer and then 24 25 feet to the last vertical oh, for the hunters like i said i like to i do i don't usually canter in to um to a, a gymnastic like this one i'm trying to teach them to slow down and relax it makes sense Mm -hmm. Great exercises. Yeah. Yeah. Those are really good exercises. Exactly. Um, we talked about, excuse me for a second. Mm. Okay. I'm back. You no, know, I have allergies. Um, I've completely lost my train of thought. Rescue mm -hmm. me, Laura. Back to um, me. Excellent. Back to you. Okay. So uh, is there, if there's any other questions or comments, we certainly would, oh, it looks like we have some comments here. Uh, we have uh, here, excellent session from Gardner Powell. Thank you very much. Oh, Gardner. Hello, Gardner. <laughs> Love those glasses. <laughs> those are awesome. Excellent. Uh, so uh, there's some also some somebody was wanting to know about um, Hunter Barnes in Tennessee, and there's some chat about that. So we'll just leave that to the chat. Uh, what about what's happening next, Randy? What's oh. happening next on jumper instruct jumping instructors? <laughs> and if, you, if while we're talking about that, if you have any questions for Robert, please put them in the comments because we love to get to them. We are closing in, so we are going to just make a an announcement for what's happening next on Jumping Instructors while you put your comments and questions in the chat. It'd right. be fun. It would be fun for our, uh, the next evening chat to talk about where it all started. I mean, for me, it started with a trail ride when I was about nine well, years old. That was going to be my question. You know? How did you get into your, your, I was going to be specific about showing on the line because a lot of people don't really talk about it, think about it. 
Well, when I started riding and, and this and that, I was a young boy. And of course, things had to be exciting. So jumping was a lot of fun. I really started out with eventing when I actually got to own my own horse. And that's what was available to me in the area. The farm that I boarded at, which I ended up actually running when I came back from Europe in 1984, um, the North Hammock was the plot of land on the island, hence the North Hammock Stables name. Um, that's that We had a, a bit of an event course out through the groves and the woods and um, a very large pony club influence. So, you know, eventing is what I started out doing as a teen. And then um, I had some farrier issues and I got introduced to a very good farrier who, who shot horses on the circuit by the name of Fred Burnett. Well, through him, he's like, you know, hey, you might want to be interested in, in riding with Buddy Brown or how about Rodney Jenkins? So he facilitated, you know, some different clinics and workshops that I was able to attend as a young man to, to ride with some of who I thought was the, and who obviously are some of the best in the world. And um, that was that was a luck. I mean, that was total luck for me and um, invaluable information. And what, you know, those two that I mentioned in specific, what great teachers. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that ride and don't teach well. Those two, those two gentlemen were amazing teachers. Amazing. Which is so cool. And then, and so you swapped over. I, I started with eventing also. Um, and, you, and you swapped over. And, mm -hmm. and knowing, you know, the trick is that, so the farrier came to your barn and mm -hmm suggested that to you and you grabbed it yes and so many times there's things like all i i mean not that i'm at all at the level of those two but i'll somebody will say well you should go take a lesson with patty and mm -hmm. then they they don't and or a trainer will i'll say you know i'll be happy to help you i'm at a horse show and i'll be happy to help you i'm not taking clients i'm not trying to do this and they don't take advantage of it. And it's like, okay, it's okay. But maybe if people would take advantage of those little steps, then I'll go, wow, this one might be really, really good. Let me, let me get on the phone and call somebody and um, see if I can get them to, to the next step. So knowing to walk through those doors when they're open is an important part of life, but it's a really important part of the horse world. Taking a chance. I see we have a question from Abby Eric Eckstein. Um, what is the best age to start a young horse or buy a young horse if you want to train it in the hunter jumper world? Um, okay, um, let's err on the side of caution here for a second. If you don't have any experience with young horses, hopefully you're doing this with somebody that does. Um, once again, you're developing their personality for the rest of their life. You don't want to make a major mistake and get yourself or them hurt. Okay, now that once we've said that, um, typically you, we start riding these horses when they're structurally able to carry the weight, meaning their carpels and their knees are in a, in a, in a stage to where they, they won't collapse the cartilage plates and stuff. So meaning the, the term is their knees are closed. So at a certain age, typically around three, four, um, the horse's knees are able to handle um, this, this job of being ridden and whatnot. So basically you're looking at, at a three-year-old, maybe a little older if you want to start one under saddle um, is, is the rule of the textbook rule of thumb. Um, I don't know if that answered your question completely, but um, I would say you start them around three when they're structurally sound enough to be able to carry weight safely and not injure themselves easily. And I like how you emphasize always starting them, for example, from ground poles and slowly moving up with our heights. Under the direct, Patience if, is if you're not a trainer yourself, make sure you have somebody supervising. Yeah. That's so important. Even, even trainers, ground a ground person is invaluable. Right. Oh my gosh, it's invaluable. What you're feeling on a horse is not always what it looks like. Right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. 
All right, so we're going to talk about a few of the things that we're starting. We're almost to the end of our show now. We're yeah, so we are. we're so happy. Everybody's been showing up and talking to us. And Robert, thank you for everything. You're, you're, great. you're very welcome. I'm having fun. It is fun. It's fun to talk about horses with horse people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really is. <laughs> It, it yeah. is, there's, there's nothing like horse people talking, especially during this okay. time. So we have two upcoming shows that have just, we've were our whole purpose is to inspire everybody through this time and find met more ways to entertain you and bring you more ideas and thoughts that you can use to become a success, even more of a success in whatever you're doing in the horse business. So the first show is starting this Wednesday and it's called Rider Position Fixes. This is it right here. And you can see that Laura Kellen May, the co-host here, will be sharing and with Patty. With, with, yep. mm -hmm. And Patty, that's right. And Patty, they're going to be talking to Jay Duke. For those who don't know Jay Duke, he's an Equestrian Canada senior course designer. Wasn't he in the Nations Cup or something representing yep. the... Tell us a little bit about him, Pat, uh, Laura. Oh, jeepers. You're putting me on the spot, Patty. I'm putting you on the spot. Wait, yeah, hi. you are. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Jay I have it right here. He's a Canadian senior course designer who was named the leading male rider at the Spruce Meadows North American Tournament and represented Canada on the Nations Cup team in both the USA and in Canada. Yeah. So, so she, that's going to be the first guest. And what topics are you going to talk about? Well, the topics are, I don't have that right in front of me. Rider position, rider position fixes. Rider position fixes, yeah. So everything I have them right with ride. Oh, yeah, great. Everything. We'll read them out then. Okay, some of the topics for her first, for the first show they do together will be, number one, how simple rider position changes will bring you more success in the show ring. Mm -hmm. Two, rider position exercises that will take your riders to the next level. Yeah. Three, how to get connected with your riding position in the warm up, and four unmounted exercises that you can use to improve your rider's position. So that's going to begin on Wednesday at one o'clock p.m. right here on the Jumping Instructors page. Again, it'll be a Facebook Live, so you will see the post show up as a show, and the show will begin. And then yeah, we the other thing about that, uh, Randy, uh, is that we are having. Uh, people send in their riding positions to the Equestrians Live at gmail.com. Yeah, and I'm we'll just trying to find it here. Section, you'll see that there. There, we go. there Equestrians Live at Gmail. If you'd like to have your position reviewed by Jay. Are your riders? Are your riders? That's right. If you if you'd like to have your riders' position reviewed to get some some additional tips on what's happening. Please send us a photo. Those are very popular. I, I enjoy doing those. I've been doing one for a club, actually, myself. They send me five pictures, and I evaluate them and then pin them in oh, the order them. that they would place. And it's been it's been a lot of fun doing that while I've been, you know, homebound. And it's been enjoyable. And um, people really appreciate the feedback for, you know, on their own, their own pictures. So... Right. It, it's, it, it makes it more applicable and you can actually see the, the critique. So I, I really like that format. I really like that. Yeah. Now our so, second show that we're going to be starting the following week will be the Jay Duke show. Let's see. Do we have a list of what he's bringing in? Do you have that in front of you, uh, Laura? No, I just have what the, our next few guests that we're going to be having. He is, uh, we can look that up. on. So the he's Facebook. got his first show. He has, uh, I don't remember the course designer's name, an international course designer. And the second, he does his shows on Monday nights at 7.30. And then he's got a panel he's, of people who have who have been, who are Hope race Glenn runners. And Hope Glenn and Diane Carney are two of his panelists. Yeah. Yep. And, um, I can't remember the others, but. And then he's doing a panel on concussions. So he's brought people for that of uh, dealing with it from the racehorse point of view, but it's all, you know, it's a big thing in the horse industry. A lot of people, we've all had concussions, right? Mm. <laughs> so he's got a panel of experts who will be talking about concussions and he'll be coming up with his own unique, you know, like all of our hosts, they all have their own specialty. So that they focus I'm just on. reading it here, Randy. It's uh, Guilherme Jorge, George, Guilherme Jorge. That's the course designer. Yeah. Joey Gatlin and Morley Abbey, Derek Braun, 
expert panel of doctors to discuss concussions and head safety awareness. Perfect. Those are, yeah. So we have all kinds of new shows that we're, we've created to make a difference for what you're doing as a professional in the horse business. And um, uh, what would you, anybody want to add anything else? Thank you well, so much. I appreciate yes, you being with us Robert, today. Everybody. It was great having you on. And maybe, yes. and Laura, maybe we should get Robert on one Wednesday for a Oh, you bet. I, you, I've just, I just put him in. I just scheduled you in. I like Robert. that very much. Anytime, <laughs> ladies, anytime. I enjoy and, this. And Randy, who do we have coming up soon? We, we have um, on our show, on this show. Well, we've got a list of people because I put out a press release and we're getting a lot of attention right now. So we will announce who will be coming up in our next shows. We're going to do it on Fridays. Now we've been playing with something called Zoom. So we're Zooming with the, with the jumping instructors. We found that with the Zoom, people like it because everybody can come on the screen and interact with us, which we did it la the last week, right? We had a great time with it. So we'll be Zooming on Fridays instead of having another show. It'll be a Zoom. It will not be recorded, but you can come and join the Zoom party and have fun with that. It'll be fun. That will be fun. So thank you again so much, Robert, for coming with us. And I know we're going to see you again. Thanks anytime. for inviting me in any time, any time. I love to share. It was fun. And hopefully we can keep going with this a little bit after, probably not three times a week, but right. um, after it's all over. And remember, as Laura likes to say, to go use this stuff. Guts. Right. Use this stuff. Have some guts. Go use this stuff. <laughs> we'll see and you on the other side of the fan. Ask questions. Like if you don't understand something, you try something, send one of us a, email or a Facebook or a something and we'll try to help you through even it. a little video sometimes a, video. a little video you might you might be missing something that you know on a little video you go oh you know let's let's back up and try this right share exactly. this post share this share this post show the show share this show with your friends you can share it on your profile you can share it on your page you can show it in groups so other people can see what we're sharing that makes a difference with them also all right everybody thank we'll you very you much bye. Thank you. bye okay i'm gonna end bye. Really bye.